Good morning. Welcome to Onalaska United Methodist Church. We're glad that you are here with us this morning. Isn't the snow beautiful outside today? We can still say that after last week, I think. Uh, my only issue with this snow is that I still have to throw it on top of the snow from last week up above my head. So even though it's just an inch or two, the shoveling's still going to be a bear. But uh, anyway, uh, like I said, uh, we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. My name is Paul Bratch. I am the Director of Discipleship here at OUMC. Before we begin the service today, we just have a few announcements. First of all, in your bulletin, you should have a blue card that looks like this. Um, if you are a visitor, we would love to have you fill this out with your contact information so that we can follow up with you and uh, help you get connected to the community here at OUMC. If you are a member, um, we would also love for you to um, put your name on here and just update your contact information if you need to, uh, and that helps us get a good count of who's here. Um, you may have noticed in the new entryway that um, there is a photo booth out there. We are still taking photos um, to update them for the church directory, and so if you're interested in doing that and haven't had a chance to do that yet, after the service, um, you can go he head out there and just fill out a quick sheet and they'll get your picture taken. It's pretty quick and painless. Um, was there anyone that wanted to talk about the uh, loves for love today? Okay, excellent. We have a few people here from our sixth grade class to give you an update on their diaper drive. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody in the congregation for helping out with this. You guys have been awesome. It's great. Um, um, all the support that you guys have given us. Um, we're going to be collecting diapers through the month of February. And then uh, the, uh, when is it? The uh, first Sunday of March, uh, Megan and the kids and I are going to be going to uh, the Anna Food Basket to uh, show them all the diapers we've collected. With your help, we have raised 2,151 pairs of diapers for the Anna Food pa Basket. We are 2,849 under our goal. We would appreciate your support. With the diapers we have collected so far, we are able to help nine babies for one month. Please tune into Channel 19 as we We'll be on the news tonight. Thank you. All right. Thanks again for your support and tell your friends. And I think we can crush this 5,000 uh, goal. I think we'll, uh, we're will we looking good. Plus, we have the media and everything. So we should be good. So thank you very much again. Right. So um, next Sunday... With February being a short month, next Sunday is the last Sunday to bring in the diapers for the diaper drive. So please be sure to bring them in by next Sunday. And like they said, um, Channel 19 is actually going to be here this morning um, with a camera. They'll be interviewing students. Um, they were also, also had a picture and a quick write-up in the uh, Channel 8 news recently, too. So um, thank you for your support with that. And then finally... Uh, we have a really strong Stephen ministry program here. Our Stephen ministers are people that uh, walk alongside um, people that are going through a difficult time in their lives. And um, we are looking to um, build an even larger group of Stephen ministers. There's a lot of need for that kind of thing. And so the Stephen ministers are accepting applications for new Stephen ministers. If you're interested in that, you can talk with um, Becky Barnes or Ellie Molstad. And the due date for the, the applications is March 24th, and then they'll have a, a new class um, starting up for the brand new Stephen Ministers beginning April 1st. All right, I think that is it for the announcements, so uh, let's begin by standing and greeting each other with the peace of Christ. <laughs> Join me in the opening prayer. 
Come to Christ, that living stone, rejected by the world, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. We have responded to Christ's call and seek to be built unto a spiritual house, a living reminder of God's presence on earth. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people, called out of the darkness into God's marvelous light. Therefore, we proclaim with the church in all ages, blessed be your name, O God, our Redeemer. In your mercy, we have been born anew in the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Please join in the um, opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, uh, in your red hymnal, page 89, verses 1 through 3. Opening scripture today is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This ends the reading. And would the children come up, please? Well, good morning, everybody. I am not Jessica. My name is Jean, and I help out with children's sermons sometimes. So it's good to see all of you this morning. So we just heard a scripture reading about being a part of God's marvelous light. What do you think that means? If we're a part of God's marvelous light, what does that mean? It's kind of a hard question, John. So when we're a part of God's light, we're a part of God's mercy and God's love. What else? God's forgiveness. Right? What else? We can use God as our light, as our guiding path. Very good. And you know what else it means? It means that when we are part of God's family, we also have a responsibility to share God's light with other people too, right? So how do we do that? How do we share God's light? 
invite them to come to church. We just heard something about the diaper drive. Is that a way to share God's light with others? Yeah, do service projects. Be kind and forgiving. So how do you think we can be reminded of God's light, that God's light is always with us? There's lots of reminders. Lots of light sources around us, right? What are some sources of light around here? Just look around the sanctuary, around the church. How can we be reminded of God's light? John, thank you so much. Let's have somebody other than John this morning. <laughs> what, are, what are some other sources of light? What do we see? What's up there? There's lights right there, shining, in our, shining right there in our eyes. Where's other light? Candles, excellent. Where else? Where else do you see a light? Outside. What's that? Even though it's not out today, it's not shining right now, but what? The sun. It's a great reminder of God's light. What else? Maybe if it's not here in the sanctuary, where else are, where else are there lights? What about lightning bugs? Yeah, summer. Lightning. Lightning. What else? There's so many sources of light. Cell phone flashlights, right? And you don't have a night light? Night lights? Yeah. Yeah, Lydia has an alarm clock that has a light on it. There's so many reminders all around us that we are surrounded by God's light and we can be God's light to other people, okay? So there's also something that we didn't talk about that we didn't say was a source of light, but one of our favorites are glow sticks, yes. So we have a little present for you. You can each take a glow stick, okay? And there's the little, can you hold that for just a second? So you can get your glow stick and then you can get the little connector that goes with it, okay? And then we'll say a prayer. All right, so go ahead and take one out of there. They're all the same color. Yep. They're yellow. Every single one is yellow. <laughs> yep, the ones in the other tubes are yellow. All right, if you want it, you can, whatever you do, bend them. Make them excellent, okay, thank you. All right, so let's say a prayer, okay? Holy God, we thank you for your love and your mercy and for always calling us into your light. We ask that you help us remember that you love us and that we are also called to help remind people that you love them too. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, each Sunday in our service, and yeah, you can either stand here or go up there, whatever you prefer. I'm scarier up there. Okay, all right. I'll just give you a quick intro. So, <laughs> so each week in our Sunday services, uh, we have what we call a God moment. And this is a time when someone from our congregation um, has a chance to speak about what God is doing in their life or what God is doing through a particular ministry. Um, so this morning, we have Jeff Morehouse to talk with us about trustees. So I don't get to stand up here very often. And some of you are, have nervous looks on your faces because I'm usually, as trustee chair, I'm asking for a whole bunch of money for some church project. Be at ease, I'm not doing that this morning. For trustees, I want to talk about two things this morning. Uh, first about the trustees budget because I'm sure uh, most of you don't, you know, go to the charge conference and go right to trustees and go down the line and see what, uh, how much money are trustees spending today, you know, that's not probably what you're doing. So I'm going to share that a little bit with you today so you have a perspective on what your, all of your gifts to the stewardship fund in terms of the trustees and running this building, what that, what that amount is. And it's significant. The second thing I'm going to talk to you about is more personal to me uh, as serving on trustees. 
So first I need a volunteer. I got a volunteer in the back, look at that, perfect. So what we're gonna do is, I, I'm gonna turn the lights off and then we're gonna turn them back on. I was gonna do this with the heating system, but I thought maybe it'd be a little tough to come in here at 50 degrees and then try to warm it up. So I thought better of that. So we're gonna turn the lights off and what I'm gonna do is take the trustee's budget and go ahead and turn it off and, and put that in terms of, of turning the lights on in the building, okay? So we spend a lot of money for maintenance and snow removal, which they're doing a terrific job this morning, and for lawn mowing and uh, insurance and all those sorts of things just to keep the lights on in the building. So we're gonna turn the lights back on, please. Thank you for your help. The lights come on, that cost us $100. We turn the lights on in this room right here in the sanctuary 16 times a week. $1,600 a week to keep the building going, $80,000 a year, what it costs to keep the building and the grounds maintained and functioning the way we want them to. And the important thing here is all of your gifts to the, to the stewardship fund, when you pledge and give money to the church, that's what keeps the lights on. And I thank you for that. So now for me personally, I believe it's been God's will for me to serve on trustees. I've been on trustees quite a while. And I'm gonna read a little thing here I have from, and it's also from 1 Peter, the, the text this morning was from 1 Peter. I'm reading from chapter, uh, uh, chapter four, verse 10. <clears throat> Make sure I get this at the right distance so I can see it. <laughs> Each of us has a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Each of us has a gift to use and use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I have often thought about what God has intended for me, and then I have the realization that I don't know what that answer to that question is. I think God does reveal our gifts to us. It might be something that makes our hearts sing, it might be something that's not revealed to us and we do it unknowingly. I also believe that when, a, when I question what I'm doing, God answers me in my heart. It either feels right or it doesn't. If it feels right, it aligns with God's will for our gifts. So I did stand up here not too long ago and ask you all to replace the boilers in the building, a $120,000 project. To replace the boilers, we gutted the boiler room, put new boilers in and replaced all the controls in the whole building with modern electronic controls. We didn't really know how that was gonna work. We just knew that it would, okay? And we had some bugs with it and we got that all worked out. And then we have Easter, which is this, uh, actually the last two Easter's were very similar, but the last Easter, and you know how Easter is, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's warm. Well, last Easter, last spring, it was cool at night. Got down to about 50 degrees, and so I'm thinking in my head the boilers are running. Okay, 50 degrees, heat's on. Well, by the time church service started, it was about 65. Ah, so the boilers aren't running anymore. But in here, of course, with a packed house on Easter morning, you know what that's like. Gets a little warm. I'm sitting back here in the back row. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling warm. I'm looking at the bullet, and I look up, and I see people doing this. That makes a trusty chair feel really good. <laughs> and then my heart is just filled with joy. Because in the ceiling behind me, I hear the air handlers come on, which means the air conditioning is just turned on all by itself. Wonderful to have electronic controls. I'm sure there were people in the church on Easter morning, didn't think too much of it, didn't even notice it. Some of you probably felt cooler all of a sudden as a relief, felt good. I don't think too many of you were thinking, man, those air handlers are running, that's a good deal. I guess for me, I just wanna say that it's been a wonderful blessing to serve on trustees. And the joy I felt when those air handlers came on is just an example of God telling me that I'm doing what he wants me to do. Thanks. Please join me now in our prayer of confession. 
Holy and merciful God. May Almighty God, who caused light to shine out of darkness, shine in our hearts, cleansing us from all our sins and restoring us to the light of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. And we continue with our response song, Make Us One. Do you ever catch yourself thinking that you're more talented than you are? Um, sometimes I find myself at a concert and I'm standing there amazed at, at an incredible guitar solo that's happening and I'm thinking, yeah, I could probably do that if, if, if I really wanted to. Or uh, I finish up a, a favorite novel like East of Eden by John Steinbeck and I close the cover and I think, yeah, it's probably time for me to write my great novel now. Uh, I, I sometimes get a little delusional like that. When I was going to school in Denver, I didn't have a car, and I needed to work somewhere within walking distance, so I found myself working as a rent-a-cop. I was one of several security guards at an outdoor mall, uh, checking fire alarms, chasing shoplifters, filing endless reports. And then one day our boss came in and announced that we were going to start carrying pepper spray. And so of course we were immediately really excited about this uh, until we learned that in order to carry pepper spray, you need to be sprayed with pepper spray. I guess the idea is that you're supposed to know how it feels, so you use it respectfully, you don't misuse it. So spray day arrives and uh, this tough cowboy looking police sergeant from a little town up in the mountains comes to train us on the proper way to pepper spray somebody. So first there was this lecture portion. It was pretty boring and we were trying really hard to listen, but we were just really anxious about how we were about to get sprayed in the face with pepper spray. We were also really giddy with excitement for getting to watch all of our coworkers cry. Um, the, the only thing that I do remember the sergeant saying was that about one in every 1,000 people is immune to pepper spray. So later, uh, he finished up the lecture and then it was time for us to get sprayed. The sergeant, he stood about 10 feet away from us and he was really nice to us. He, he let us um, cover up half of our face with a hand and then we could hold our breath and close our eyes and he would spray us in the face and then we had to open our eyes, which is when the magic happened. Uh, see, the spray is activated by water, and so once it, it makes contact with your tears, that's when uh, the pain happens. So I'm standing there waiting my turn. I'm having a great time watching all of my uh, coworkers dropping to the ground and screaming in pain whenever they would open up their eyes. But then it was my turn, and I was really, really nervous. Uh, the sergeant kept saying, okay, are you ready? And I'd say, yeah, I'm ready. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. 
Okay, all right, I'm ready. No, 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 hold on, hold on, not yet, not yet. Uh, but eventually I said, okay, go. And, uh, and so I, I covered half of my face with my hand, I closed my eyes, I held my breath, and then I felt the spray hitting me in the face and starting to drip down my face. And then I heard him say, okay, open your eyes. And so I gathered up all my courage, I opened my eyes, and nothing happened. I felt absolutely nothing at all. I was the one out of a thousand people who was immune to pepper spray. And so I started to shout, I'm immune. And before I could finish the word immune, it kicked in. <laughs> I screamed and I dropped to the ground, writhing in pain. And my coworkers had never seen something so funny in their entire lives because I thought I was so special and I was so different from everyone else, but I found out the hard way that I was just the same. So we are in the middle of a sermon series right now called We Are Family, and we're talking about life together as a church. And today we're talking specifically about how God calls us to be a peculiar kind of family. Some of us may have a couple peculiar families. Um, so sometimes people have the impression that church people or that a church family is just like everybody else, that we're no different from the community around us. And honestly, in a lot of ways, that's true. There are polls and there are statistics that show that in the United States, um, Christians are not that much different than the people around us when it comes to a wide variety of behaviors. Things like helping people who are homeless, giving to charity, recycling, um, things like wanting revenge on other people. There are a lot of ways that Christians act the same as the world around them. On the other hand, here in, La in the La Crosse area, for example, we have two hospitals, and both were started by Christian groups. And there are food banks and homeless shelters, rescue missions, parenting resources, refugee services, the list goes on and on. And nearly all of them are run or were started by Christians. Christians and people of faith in our society have helped lead the way in support for people who are in need. So the real story is this. Christians are not always different, but we ought to be, and a lot of times we are. So when I was attending UWL, I was convinced to check out a college ministry. Uh, up to that point, I had grown up in a church, but in my church, uh, the young adults kind of checked out after high school. And you might see them come back and reappear when they had kids later on. But I hadn't seen any examples of young adults who were really excited about their faith and who were living it out. But right after I arrived at UWL, there was a guy in my dorm uh, who came and invited me to this campus ministry. And uh, I had nothing else to do. I didn't really know anybody. And so I said yes. Um, that night, I experienced some strange things when I attended that campus ministry. First, I walked into a packed auditorium. I didn't know that there were young people who were, who were into this kind of thing. Second, they all seemed really excited to be there. Third, Everyone was really nice and welcoming. Within the first few minutes, uh, I was introduced to people from my dorm, people that I had shared interests with, girls. And then fourth, it, I noticed that it was a gathering of really dissimilar kinds of people. There were football players there, there were math tutors, there were guys, there were girls, there were people from different ethnicities and cultures people with disabilities, a couple people who were using an ASL interpreter, there were grad students, there were undergrads, and I was just thinking, what is, what is going on here? Why, why are all these people together in the same room? A few minutes later, a leader stood up and he welcomed everyone, and the room felt really warm and inviting. A group of students led us in some music and some singing with guitar and drums and bass. There were nearly 200 college students who were really excitedly singing and clapping and sometimes even jumping up and down as they were worshiping. They just seemed so happy. 
And then when the music was done, an older student got up on stage and she started sharing her testimony, kind of a, a brief story of her life and what God had been doing in it. And she was really open about her struggles and the things that had gone on in her life, talking about things like drinking and abuse and other experiences she had had. And I had never heard anyone talk that transparently before about their life. Then the leader came back up and, and taught about the Bible in a way that was really relevant to me as a college student. And uh, afterward, the, the guy that invited me, he asked me what I thought, and I told him that I would be back for sure. I had never had such a peculiar church experience before, and uh, I was really intrigued. So uh, we had a reading this morning from 1 Peter. Peter uh, was one of Jesus' closest followers, and he wrote this letter later on in his life. And again, in the letter, he says this, but you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Now the King James Version of that passage phrases it like this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And I love that phrase, peculiar, a peculiar people. To me, it captures the feeling that I had when I attended that campus ministry that first night. Those people were peculiar and in the best kind of way. They were, they were strange, they were weird, they were different from the ordinary uh, and the things that I was used to experiencing and I wanted what they had. So let's talk a little bit about what being a peculiar family does not mean. We sometimes can confuse a call to be different with a call to be separate. But God doesn't call us to be separate from the world around us, just different. We're supposed to be a part of our community, but we're called to a new way of living within that community. We are in the world, not of the world. Being a peculiar people does not mean that we buy into this idea of us versus them. Being peculiar also does not mean that we are better than other people. God is calling everyone to be a part of this peculiar family. Remember what it said in 1 Peter just a moment ago? You are a chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession, and then it says, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. This call to be different is a call to love and serve others, to show others the goodness of God. That's what we are called to, that's what makes us different. What else does it mean to be peculiar? If those are the things that it doesn't mean, what does it mean for us to be called to be this peculiar kind of family? Um, very simply, it means that we live in the way of Jesus. And if we do that, we're going to stand out. Um, you may be looked at as strange, weird, different from the ordinary, or peculiar if you live in the way of Jesus. Like if I, um, through the power of God's spirit, if I tell the truth in my life, I'm going to be an oddity. If I learn to slow down, to live without being ruled by anger, to actually forgive and pray for people that try to cut me down, I will be considered weird because that's not the way that this world typically works. So there's an early Christian document known as the Epistle to Diognetus. And it's from somewhere in the years uh, 120 to 200. And in this document, the author writes a response to some of this propaganda that's circulating about this new group called the Christians. Uh, is circulating throughout the Roman Empire. People are spreading these false rumors about the Christians and saying that they're a dangerous secret society filled with bizarre behavior. People were saying really slanderous things about the Christians like that they practiced incest because they would call each other brother and sister and that they practiced cannibalism because they would eat and drink the body and blood of Christ. So in one important section from this document, the author describes how Christians are alike and how they're different from the people around them. 
It says this, The difference between Christians and the rest of mankind is not a matter of nationality or language or customs. Christians do not live in separate cities of their own, speak any special dialect, nor practice any eccentric way of life. They pass their lives in whatever township, Greek or foreign, each one's lot has determined. And they conform to ordinary local usage in their clothing, diet, and habits. So in other words, they live among us, they look just like us, they are a part of our community. You can't tell them apart from anyone else. And then it says, nevertheless, the organization of their community does exhibit some features that are remarkable and even surprising. For instance, though they are residents at home in their own countries, their behavior is more like transients. Though destiny has placed them here in the flesh, they do not live after the flesh. Their days are passed on earth, but their citizenship is in the heavens. They obey the laws, but in their private lives, they transcend the laws. They show love to all people, and all people persecute them. They are misunderstood and condemned, yet by suffering death, they are quickened to, into life. They are poor, yet making many rich, lacking all things, yet having all things in abundance. They repay curses with blessings and abuse with courtesy. They continually do good. So when I was living in Denver, at my church there, um, the, the pastor was mentoring me, which basically meant that on Tuesdays, I would go hang out with him and just do whatever he was doing on that particular Tuesday. Um, one Tuesday, we were doing something in his office, and he received a call out of the blue from a man who had looked up Denver Church in the phone book. And uh, so he called our church and asked if we had any books that he could read, because uh, he was living at a nursing home, and he was bored, and he didn't have anything to do. And so um, we, we kind of searched around the church, and in the basement, we found a box of some old books, and uh, we took a, the, a few of the less strange-seeming ones and um, put them in his car, and we drove out to this nursing home. Um, it turned out that, that uh, this nursing home that he lived in was specifically for people that, uh, that had been diagnosed with really serious traumatic brain injuries. And uh, so some of them were older, some of them were very young. And we talked with him and some of the other residents and staff, and some of the other residents there said that they were also really bored, they had nothing to do there, and that the highlight of each day was you know, going outside to smoke a cigarette. And some of them said that they didn't get visitors. One gentleman said that he didn't know if he still had any family. So in the season leading up to that Christmas, we went back to that nursing home and talked to the staff and we asked them if they could talk to all the residents and find out what, what they would like for Christmas because our church wanted to buy Christmas presents for the people that lived there. And so the, the director asked us, okay, sure, we can do that. Uh, how many of the residents? And we said, well, all of them. And she just stood there silently for a moment and then broke down crying. And she said, why would you want to do this? What, and what is it about these people that, that makes you want to do this? Because no one, no one cares for these people. These people are just on their own and they're forgotten. And so we got to tell her uh, all about how God changes us, how God helps us to love others. And uh, in that moment, our church seemed quite peculiar to her. I have friends that have uh, picked up their families and all moved to the same neighborhood and bought one extra house nearby, and they use that house to one by one help families to transition out of homelessness. I know people who like to go out early on Black Friday each year uh, and just bring a cart with some hot cocoa and uh, marshmallows and stuff, and they just give out hot cocoa to the people that are standing in line uh, waiting for deals out in the cold. I know a campus minister who drags two ugly yellow chairs into the center of campus at UWL every once in a while, along with a sign that says, tell me your story. And he sits down in one chair and just listens, and the other chair is never empty, because there, there are just so many people who want to be heard. How are you peculiar? In particular, how are you peculiar in the way of Jesus? 
in the ways that you love and serve others, in ways that, that stand out from our culture. I know we have many people here in our church and in our community who are loving and serving others in simple ways, in creative ways, in surprising ways. What is one particular act of peculiarity that you could engage in this week? What is one small thing that you could do this week to love someone, to serve someone, to forgive someone, to help someone? Uh, what I actually want to do now here is I want to take a moment for us to just sit in silence and to listen for God. I want you to take a moment to um, just ask God to, to speak to you, ask God to give you some inspiration, and then we're just going to listen and uh, see what God has to say to us about what we might be able to do to help someone else this week. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to share? Does anyone have an idea they'd like to share out loud with the group? It can be big, it can be simple. No, that's okay. <laughs> but I want you to be thinking this week and continuing to pray about ways that you can be peculiar. Um, little simple acts that you can do that make you stand out from the world around you and uh, make, make people think, I want, I want what that person has. Um, in particular, as we were just sitting there in silence, I'm thinking and looking outside, I'm thinking I could certainly help a neighbor, neighbor shovel this afternoon. Um, that's something small I think I could do. Well, let's go ahead and pray to wrap up the sermon here. Loving God, we want to thank you this morning. We thank you because um, you forgive when it's not deserved. You're generous when you receive nothing in return. You create beauty, you work for peace, you love us just as we are. And this week we ask that you would um, inspire each one of us to some small act of love or service that we can do for someone around us. Would you help us to be peculiar this week and to stand out? Um, help us to stand out for the ways that we are becoming like you. Thank you for inviting us all into your family so that we can show others the goodness of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we enter into our prayer time this morning, um, we have a chance to share our joys and our concerns with God and with one another. So uh, what specific requests do we have this morning? Yeah, yeah, prayers for Keith, who's having rectal cancer surgery tomorrow. Oh, happy birthday, Lydia. Congratulations. So Lydia turned seven this past week. Thank you. Prayers for those who are serving us on a daily basis. Okay, so prayers for Isol, who had a fall and broke several ribs. Let's go ahead and lift up the prayers of the church. Father God, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy and hear our prayers. God, this morning we bring before you um, prayers of, of thanks and prayers of joy um, for birthdays like Lydia who turned seven recently. God, we also bring before you prayers um, asking for your protection for those who are protecting us and taking care of us like those in our military, police, fire department, EMTs, those who are, are continually um, putting themselves in harm's way to protect us. We also ask for healing. We ask for your presence and your peace for uh, Keith, who is undergoing cancer surgery tomorrow. We pray that it would be successful, that he would um, be cancer-free, that, um, that he would recover quickly. And we pray for Isil, that uh, she would also recover quickly from her broken ribs. God, for all of these requests, we ask that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. We ask that you would come and bring good out of difficult situations, that you would bring the peace, healing, the joy, and the hope that we so desperately need. And we ask now that you would bless us and empower us and send us out to share your love with everyone we meet. And we join together now to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Well, as God gives to us, uh, we want to give to others and be generous with what we have. So would the ushers please come forward for the collection.
please rise. Generous God, you are worthy to receive all glory, honor, and praise, for by your will all things are created and have their being. Bless now these gifts that we offer, and thanks for your great faithfulness. Amen. Well, we want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Um, we hope that your time here has been meaningful. If you would like to meet with someone this week to talk or pray, um, feel free to call the office, Pastor Park, myself, or our Stephen ministers. Any of us would love to chat with you. Let's close this morning with a final song and then a blessing. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.